Janet, or The Christmas Stockings, by Louise Elise Gibbons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Roger Moline. Janet, or The Christmas Stockings, by Louise Elise Gibbons. 1. In the doorway of an old tenement house, far down in the slums of New York, two women were standing, their heads close together as they gossiped about the passers-by. A young girl, she might have been thirteen, tripped along the sidewalk, kicking her legs out in front of her as she went so that she could see her stockings. Her odd movements caught the women's eyes, and they asked each other what could be the cause of them. "'I never see her act like that before. Putting on such airs. Dear, dear! Saw ye ever the likes of it?' "'Oh, see her new stockings?' said the younger woman. "'What mighty fine ones! Did you ever?' "'I doubt she came by them in no good way,' said the other. "'Janet, young'un, see here!' The child stopped, holding up her tattered gown to show her pretty stockings. "'Who gave you them?' cried the woman who had called her. The girl replied quietly, "'Twas the bishop give me em. At this the women exclaimed in chorus, "'The bishop? That's a fine tale. How'd you know it was the bishop?' Janet said Roy, the newsboy, told her, and the women asked her, "'How is it your father hasn't got hold of him? He'd sell him for drink inside of a minute.' "'Oh, I only wears him on the street,' said Janet, "'and I takes him off and hides him before I go home.' The women begged her to tell them all about it, and settled themselves comfortably to hear the story. The girl's tale ran thus. One day a lot of children were dancing on the sidewalk to the tune of an old organ grinder, and she began dancing with them. Roy then came by with his newspapers, and, putting them down on a step, seized her round the waist and whirled her off among the little children. He stopped suddenly, for a gentleman who was passing wanted a paper. The girl was overheated with her dancing, and began to fan herself with one of Roy's papers. Roy said afterwards her eyes were as bright as stars. The gentleman asked her name and where she lived, and when she told him, he said, "'Janet, if you will come to yonder church,' pointing to the steeple, "'at seven o'clock on Christmas night, I will give you something to take home with you.' Then he paid Roy for the paper and gave the change to Janet, saying with a smile, "'This will buy some refreshments for the ball.' "'Thank you, sir,' she said. "'I am very hungry. I have had nothing to eat since yesterday noon.' At this the gentleman didn't smile any more, but looked sad. "'Why did you dance, then?' he said. Roy spoke before she had a chance to answer. "'Sir, Janet was hungry and cold, and that was the best way to get warm.' The gentleman walked away, and she could see him rub the back of his hand across his eyes. She asked Roy what his name was, and he said he didn't know, but it was the bishop. She bought something to eat with the money and divided it with Roy and he ran off to sell his papers. The organ grinder went on his way, and the children stopped dancing. So on Christmas night Janet went early to the big church, as the bishop had told her to do. When she got inside the door she stood still with wonder, for there was a great tree, as big as an outdoor tree, all lighted with little candles from the floor to the top and all over it were hanging sparkling toys. And when she came near to it, she saw the bishop standing by it. She did not think he would know her again, but he smiled and said, 
"'Janet, I was expecting you.' And then he took a stick with a hook on the end of it, and, reaching over the heads of some fine ladies who were arranging things at the foot of the tree, he took the stockings down and put them in her hands. Then he put his white hands on her head and said, "'God bless you, my child. Remember, keep yourself pure and clean to your life's end.' Each stocking had a silver dollar in the toe, and was filled with candy, and tied around the top with a blue ribbon to keep the candy in. "'See,' said Janet, as she told the story, "'I tie the ribbon on each leg to keep me from getting out.' She lifted the ragged gown to show the ribbon garters. She said she skipped out of the great big church, hugging the stockings close to her, and covering them with a bit of her shawl to hide her treasure from the people she passed. "'Don't you know such a fine bishop's name?' asked one of the women. "'No,' said the child. "'But Roy said he was the good bishop who stays down here with us and don't go away frolicking. And now I must go see Roy. There he is calling his extras at the corner.' "'Well, I never,' said one of the women, as the child skipped away. "'She seems to make friends, don't she? "'She and that boy are awful fond of each other. "'And now there's this bishop.' "'Well,' said the other, "'Janet is a pretty girl with her dark eyes "'and her hair always braided in one long plate down her back, "'and even if she is in rags, her hair is always tidy.' Her father sells everything that people give her. It's a wonder he don't cut off her hair and sell that. Well, the girl has a white skin and a pretty mouth and a straight nose, just like her mother's. She don't look and she don't act like if she was born and raised here among us poor folks. That she don't, and she's such a little mite for her age, with those little hands and feet. You wouldn't take her to be fourteen, would you now? While the women were talking her over, Janet went to find Roy, who stood at the corner shivering with the cold, with his papers under his arm. "'Hello, Roy,' said she. "'See my beautiful stockings? That bishop gave them to me off the tree, and they was full of candy and money.' Coming close to him, she said in a whisper, here's some for you and she took a little paper bag full of candy from under her ragged shawl where she had hidden it oh roy she said it was the finest tree you ever did see and the bishop gave me the stockings his own self and when he gave them to me he put his hands on my head and what do you think he said he said god bless you my child Remember to keep yourself pure and clean to the end of your life. And when he was a-saying it, he looked up at a sugar boy with shiny wings that was hanging on top of the tree. The boy and girl parted at the corner, he to sell his papers through the cold and the mire of the slums, and she to go to her poor, wretched home. She mounted the rickety stairs of an old tenement house up to the top floor, where, in one small garret, the whole family lived. In one corner of the room was an old ragged straw mattress, on which the father, mother, and baby slept. The baby was asleep now. The father was drinking in a saloon nearby. In another corner was a pile of straw where Janet and her sister Bessie slept. And in yet another, on a heap of rags and paper, lay two pretty little boys, sound asleep, unconscious of the fact that they were cold and hungry. One could see, in spite of rags and dirt, that they were like cherubs with their sunny curls. The poor mother sat by the feeble light of a candle. The wick burned nearly down to the bottle which served for a candlestick. She was sewing on a coarse garment that she wanted to finish in order to buy bread for the children with the few pennies she would get for it. 
all that any of them had eaten that day was some candy that janet had slyly put in their mouths not letting them know where she kept it janet went to her mother the poor tired sick woman and bidding her open her mouth she fed her with sweet chocolate and brought her a drink of water then she sat down by the suffering woman and hugged her poor cold feet to her heart trying to warm them in a low voice so as not to waken the sleeping children she gave her mother a description of the beautiful tree and how the bishop had given her the stockings himself i take them off and hide them when i get home she said so father will not sell them and the candy i hid last night under my pile of straw that's how i had these good chocolates for you now and then she repeated again to her mother the words of the good bishop remember keep yourself pure and clean to the end of your life the mother swallowed hard as though her throat hurt her and she became deadly pale oh mother said the child the bishop has made me feel so happy and even this old garret looks better than it did because i am so happy the mother said i feel peaceful and happy too while i listen to you you make my thoughts go back to when i was a little girl i remember a hymn i used to sing in sunday school and in a broken way gasping for breath she repeated the last two lines cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wing she leaned back raising her eyes as though she could see the angels looking down upon her, though to the outward eye only the rough, weather-stained rafters were above her. Janet fell asleep at her mother's feet. The woman's head fell forward on the unfinished work. The candle burned down, and the fallen wick spluttered into the grease. Heavy steps ascended the stairs. An unsteady hand opened the door, and a large man fell heavily to the floor. It was the drunken father, returning from the saloon. The gray streaks of early dawn came into the dingy garret and revealed the face of the dead man. A few hours later the body was removed. The two dollars the bishop had given Janet was paid out for back rent, so the poor woman and her children were allowed to stay in the wretched room a little longer. Janet took her mother's work back to the shop, which was some distance away. She trudged through the snow, cold, wet, and hungry. When she returned late in the afternoon, climbed the rickety stairs, and entered the room, she stood speechless in the middle of the floor the sun was shining through the broken panes of the one window in the garret and its rays fell like a shower of gold all over the child as she stood there crowning her head as with a halo but she heeded not its beauty she stood there struck dumb with astonishment there was absolutely nothing and no one in the room but herself father mother children mattress straw all gone the room utterly empty she knew not how long she had stood there speechless in her misery when she heard steps ascending the stairs someone fumbled in the dark hall for the latch and finally opened the door two burly men entered and asked janet who she was from them she learned that the people who had lived there were gone that they had the room to rent and would take the key at six o'clock by which time she must be gone when they went out she did not move from the sunshine a child of the slums she was used to rough men and women and was not afraid of them but she was stunned with this new trouble with her absolute loneliness where were her people what did it all mean where should she go find them light steps came swiftly up the stairs and after a gentle knock the door was opened it was roy who stepped into the spot of fading sunshine beside her 
"'Oh, Janet!' said he. "'Oh, Roy!' was all she could answer. And the boy and girl stood crowned with the golden halo in absolute silence. At last, as the sun's rays were passing away, Roy spoke. "'Janet, they're all gone. Taken away while you went with the work. Janet, the baby was dead in the night.' The child said but one word. Froze? No, said Roy. It was the diphtheri. And your mother had it, too. Somebody told on him, and so the Board of Health sent in a jiffy, and a great black ambulance came and took her and all the children, and then some men came and took everything out and burned it all and did something to the room. I came and looked at them a while, but they sent me away. I see the ambulance drive off. I was so close to it. "'Where?' Janet gasped. "'I don't know,' said the boy. Again there was silence. The children of the slums, born in poverty, sorrow, and disgrace, do not cry. Life is too stern a reality." Then Roy spoke in a whisper, as if in his untutored mind he felt that in the presence of such sorrow a loud word would be a sacrilege. "'Janet!' She turned and looked him in the face. He was pale and trembling, and the words came painfully, as if he feared to hurt her any more. "'Janet, when they took your mother out of here, she was dead. I seed her face.' I didn't say nothing, but I know she was dead, and I come now to tell you. But I wish I hadn't. You look so white and scared. The only sound was a choking gasp from the poor child. Roy took her hand in his. Janet, I love you. Don't look so white. It scares me. If anything happened to you, it would kill me. You're all I've got in the world. Don't look so. I can't stand it. I'll take care of you. I earn a good bit of money some days. I'll work hard, and then when we are older— What? said the girl, simply. Why, then we'll get the good bishop to marry us. There, now, Janet, be a good girl and come away before the men come back for I saw them going out in the street, and if they catch us here when they come for the key, they'll say we have it too, and they'll take us away in that ugly black ambulance. So she let him lead her out of that garret so full of memories, down the dark rickety stairs into the cold street. They were homeless, friendless orphans, starting out on life's stormy sea, hungry, cold, forsaken. They walked hand in hand until they were several blocks away, in another part of the slums, where Janet had never been. Then, standing in the shelter of a doorway, they looked at each other for some time in silence. At last Roy spoke. "'Janet, dear, I don't know where to take you.' "'Where do you go, Roy, at night?' said she. Oh, anywheres. Sometimes us boys sleeps in boxes, and sometimes they have straw in em, and more times not. But, you see, Janet, that won't do for the likes of you. He thought in silence for a moment. Let me see, he said. I've got ten cents in my pocket. That ought to lodge you for one night. But where? Oh, I know. Now, Janet, listen to me, and do just what I tell you. I'm going to take you to an old apple woman near here, and don't you open your mouth about the diphtheri, and don't say nothing about where you lived, or that you had any people, nor nothing. Cause if you do, nobody'll let us come near em. And I'll do what I can with the cross old apple woman. She sort of takes to me and she gives me specked apples for running errands for her. So they went on until they came to the apple stand, 
over which a torch was burning. "'Aunt Betsy,' said Roy, "'here's a poor little girl that can't be left out on the street to freeze. Won't you let the kid sleep on your floor for tonight?' "'Now, Roy,' said the old woman, "'you know you've picked up a good-for-nothing vagabond on the street. Why don't you take her to the society?' "'Locks, Aunt Betsy, I don't know nothing about societies. And fore we could find one, she'd be froze stiff. So if you won't take her in, she'll have to lie down any place and die. I've got ten cents in my pocket, and I'll give it to you if you'll keep the kid tonight.' "'Oh, you've got ten cents, have you? Well, all right. She can sleep on a bit of a mat on my floor.' and where might you be going well said he i've got to sell some extras late tonight, and i'll scare up a box to turn in somewheres say he added she's awful hungry if you'll give her a bit of grub i'll pay you for it tomorrow when i come around and give you a paper all right roy i'll do what i can so janet was settled for the night it is true she had to sleep on the floor and put up with some scraps to eat. But things go by comparison in this world, and to poor, cold, starving Janet it seemed like living in a palace. Tired and worn out, she slept soundly, forgetting all her sorrows. At last the sun rose in the glory of a new day, making the icicle sparkle in its light and decking vines, bushes, and trees with a covering of diamonds. Dame Nature, in all her glory of sparkling jewels, smiled at the ladies of the world, wearing their paltry gems, as they drove to the slums to leave some little dolls, and wooden horses, and tin watches that wouldn't go for starving, ragged, weary children. Dame Nature longed to teach them, if they would learn of her, for, besides her beauty, she was very wise in all things. But they thought they knew, and turned a deaf ear to all her teachings. When Janet opened her eyes, she rubbed them hard to collect her scattered senses. After a few minutes everything came back to her, and with a heart full of sorrow she realized her desolation. Mother, brothers, sisters, all she loved, gone. Even the drunken father did not seem so bad, now she had no one to love her. Yes, there was Roy. And then her heart seemed filled to overflowing with love and gratitude to him. She got up and asked the apple woman if she had any chores for her to do. The old woman gave her some apples to shine and pile, with the red side up, to tempt the customers as they passed by. After this was done, she gave her one of them and a piece of bread. About noon, Roy came along with three cents and a paper. Then Janet remembered the thirty cents she had been paid for her mother's sewing. She had been too full of other things to think of it before. Roy invested them in matches and pins and started her out to sell them on the street. He thought they would be doing well if, between them, they could make enough to keep body and soul together and find some shelter at night. Janet could make no plans. She only knew enough to do as Roy told her. A child of the slums, she had never been inside of any house but the most wretched tenement. She was ignorant of the names and use of the simplest things, so it was impossible to find a place of service for her. All she had ever seen were the windows of forlorn second-hand clothing stores, pawn shops, saloons, and factories. Roy's sale of papers took him into a wider field, so that he knew a little more about civilized life. The old apple woman had a mongrel dog that she had raised. He helped to guard her stand, and was a very sagacious animal. Janet and the dog became fast friends, 
and he would leave the stand and follow her on her rounds. This did not please old Aunt Betsy, so she tied him to the stand. Janet and the dog, however, still continued the best of friends. The morning that Janet had gone with her mother's work, she had dressed herself in a short skirt of her mother's and an old straw hat with a bit of black ribbon round the crown, while over her shoulders was a coarse woolen shawl. These garments were patched and mended, but they were better than the rags the poor child wore when we first saw her dancing on the pavement. The winter passed away, and the blessed summer, which is so much easier for the poor, came in its turn. Then Janet could sleep out of doors under some shed. But the summer, too, went on its way, and now October was here, with its chilly, windy nights, and the poor child was forced to appeal to the old apple woman again. She consented to let her stay for five cents a night, provided she would bring enough sticks for the fire and shine the apples and scrub the floor. When this was done, the child, often very weary, would start out to sell her wares. Her appearance was so pitiful and appealing that although she only tried to sell to those who were nearly as poor as herself, she generally made at least enough to pay Aunt Betsy her five cents and get herself some food. Roy was now employed by a regular news dealer, so he made somewhat more but their clothes were now very ragged, and Janet's feet were nearly bare. A few days after the Christmas when Janet got the stockings, the good bishop was called out of town. Not forgetting the poor little waif he had befriended, he gave special instructions to some of his fellow workers to investigate the case, and if it was found worthy, to minister to the wants of the family. They endeavored to carry out his instructions, but found the miserable garret occupied by strangers who knew nothing of little Janet or her family. When they inquired of the neighbors, they were told that the whole family had died of diphtheria, and everything that was in the room had been destroyed. Believing this report, of course they made no further effort to find poor little Janet. It seemed as if a network of misery had enveloped her, as if every avenue of relief had been blocked up. But she still had Roy, and he had Janet, and each kept hope alive in the heart of the other. It was hope on which the two children lived day by day. It gave them sweet dreams at night, and with its beacon light before them they were even happy in the midst of their miserable surroundings. One day in October, Janet was trying to sell her wares along the Bowery. Roy was calling some extras on the other side, a little farther up the street. Suddenly Janet missed the shrill voice, and looking to see what had become of him, she saw a crowd collecting about the spot where only a few minutes before she had seen Roy. In an agony of dread she hurried over, and pushing her way through the crowd, followed the men who were carrying something into a drug store. There she found poor Roy stretched out, bleeding on the floor. In crossing the street he had been knocked down by a heavy wagon, and the wheel had crushed him. With a cry of pain she pushed her way to him and knelt down by his side. He opened his eyes when he heard her voice. They met hers in one long gaze their hands clasped, his lips moved. Bending over him, she heard him whisper, "'Good-bye, Janet.' Roy was gone from her, and she was left alone. She felt a warm breath on the hand that still held Roy's, and, looking down, she saw the mongrel dog, who had broken away from the apple stand and followed her. He licked her hand, and her tears fell on his head. As she put her arms around him, she felt that he was now her only friend. The men who carried poor Roy away 
pushed her roughly aside, and in a bewildered way she followed the dog, who seemed trying to lead her to the apple woman. When Aunt Betsy saw the dog, she gave Janet an apple for bringing him back. But Janet could not eat it, though she had had nothing all day. She tried to tell the woman about Roy, but the words would not come. Death to Janet meant only the agony of separation. An hour ago she had Roy with her, and now he was not with her. This was all there was in it to the poor child, nothing beyond, no hope of meeting again. Is it to be wondered at? Uneducated, she knew nothing but her toiling daily life. She had never been in a church but that one Christmas night, and so had learned nothing through that channel of a life beyond. When Roy's dying lips murmured, Goodbye, Janet, it was forever. No home, no books, no intelligence in her life, she was but little above the plane of her only friend, the dog. To others death is but the change from darkness to light. But to Janet and to the dog it meant the end. She was only so much above the dumb brute that she could look into life a little farther, and so could suffer more. A newsboy came along and told the apple-woman the tale Janet was unable to tell. She was shocked for the moment, for she had in her rough way liked Roy. But the hard business part of her nature was uppermost in a little while. Here she was with this child on her hands. When Janet could sell nothing, as was often the case, Roy generally had a few cents to give her so she had always felt that she was sure of some little pay for the poor shelter she gave the child. But now the case was different, and so she told Janet, in no gentle way, "'You must get away from here.' "'Where?' asked Janet in a bewildered tone. "'Oh, I don't know. Go to some of the societies or to that bishop as gave you them old ragged stockings you think so much of. "'I can't,' said the girl despairingly. "'I don't know where to find him.' "'Well,' said the woman, "'you can stay here tonight, and I'll give you a bit to eat in the morning before you go.' Janet cried all night for her companion, for she knew that in the morning she would not hear his voice calling the papers. Roy was gone from her. Had he not said good-bye to her? The dog slept beside her on the floor and tried in every way he knew to comfort her as he felt her tears fall upon his head. While the old woman slept, he stole to the box and brought Janet an apple in his mouth. Somehow his kindness comforted her. She dried her tears and kissed his shaggy head. For his sake she ate the apple and tried, but in vain, to sleep. Morning at length dawned, and Janet rose, her plans all made. She did the work for the old woman, ate the dry bread and drank the weak coffee that was given her, and, after tying the dog, went forth again into the cold, hard world. The dog whined so piteously when Janet kissed him and gave her such a pleading look which she could not misunderstand that it was impossible to resist it she left him tied but in such a way that if he tried he could wriggle himself loose she bade the old woman good-bye and thanked her for the shelter she had given her roy had told her once that there was a beautiful park somewhere in the city but it was a great way off he told her there was lovely green grass in the park, and big shady trees, and quiet pools of water, that the birds sang there all day long, and beautiful flowers bloomed there until almost winter time. So the heart of the lonely waif, deserted and cast out by all mankind, turned to this beautiful spot of nature. She gathered her rags about her and started to walk to the park. 
she was not strong starvation and exposure do not give strength to children and when hope dies the cup of sorrow runs over and the little strength left is soon exhausted so she trudged along sometimes stopping for a moment to look at what she passed and often gazing at the food displayed in the shop windows for she was very hungry something in her wan white face must have appealed to a man who passed her for he stopped and gave her a penny she bought a roll with it devoured it like an animal not like a child and then walked on at last a lady passed her and asked her to carry one of the many bundles she was laden with a few blocks for her janet rose to oblige her for she was sitting on the steps of a house to rest when she had carried the bundle as far as was desired the woman gave her five cents and noticing how utterly miserable the child looked asked her where she was going to the park replied janet why my child she said that is very far away from here you had better ride in the cars but i don't know how to get the right one said janet the woman showed her the car and with the five cents she rode and rested at the same time at last she came to what she knew must be the beautiful park after she had entered it she went along in a timid fearful way till at last she came to a secluded spot she seated herself on one of the benches but from time to time she looked over her shoulders to see if the policeman the greatest terror of the poor was coming she rested a long time under the overhanging branches of a large tree how long she did not know after a while she saw throngs of people on the road driving in gay carriages she wondered if she could cross over to the water where roy had told her there were boats but she was afraid to move for fear the police would lay hold of such a ragged-looking thing as she felt herself to be on this beautiful october afternoon the grass lately mowed looked like an emerald carpet spread down the sunbeams and the shadows chased each other across it as the leaves of the trees stirred in the gentle breeze now and then some dry crisp leaves fell around janet for there had been a frost already in the early autumn little janet was very hungry and the look of starvation in her young eyes was enough to melt a heart of stone she kept her feet carefully on the path for fear of touching the grass for all around she saw the signs keep off the grass and she was afraid of trespassing at last a thought struck her she could make herself look a little better putting her hand in her bosom she pulled out the stockings the bishop had given her taking off her ragged rusty shoes she carefully drew them on they were very different now from what they were when the bishop took them off the tree and handed them to her in each one there was a hole in the toe and a hole in the heel and a number of other smaller holes all the way up until they all joined at the top to make a ragged edge it was not easy to get the torn stockings on but she pulled them up tight and tied a bit of string around them to keep them in place then she pulled them about so as to show the fewest holes and dexterously drew the old shoes over them she patted the stockings lovingly as her thoughts went back to that christmas and the tree in the church saying softly to herself and the bishop said to me god bless you my child remember to keep yourself clean and pure to the end of your life and he looked up at that sugar boy with the shining wings on the top of the tree now i wonder who that was and what he meant when he said god bless you my child who is god remember to keep yourself clean to the end of your life i'm ragged but i guess i'm clean and pure he said too 
I wonder what pure means. I can't make it all out. I do wish grand people would say words poor, ragged little girls like me could make out. But I suppose the bishop couldn't do that. And I'll never know what he wanted me to do. Well, I'll try to find them boats Roy told me about. She looked carefully around, and, watching her chance when the policeman's back was turned towards her, she passed behind him across the walk, and then sped away to the water's edge, still hiding behind trees and bushes. When she got to the water, she was struck dumb with the beautiful scenes around her. On the top of the bank, on the drive, walked another policeman. She skipped behind a tree at the edge of the water. Then she saw ducks, swans, and geese swimming right up to the land. She saw troops of children of all ages, children of the rich, beautiful, with plump cheeks and curly hair, and such lovely clothes. She saw little tots with bonnets almost as large as themselves. They were joyous and happy, laughing and talking as they fed the feathered tribe. To Janet's horror, these favored children pulled grass by the handfuls and fed the waterfowl, while the policemen talked to the nurses on the drive. Little Janet always had before her eyes the sign, Keep Off the Grass. A pretty child dropped a biscuit on the ground. Janet's hungry eyes were fixed upon it, but she dared not touch it for fear of the dreaded policeman. The lovely child looked up and caught the glance, and, like children in their fraternal, natural way, she said, "'Do you want it, little girl?' Janet nodded, and the child picked it up and gave it to her, to feed the swans with. Just then the nurse looked up from her novel and saw the child talking and handing something to this ragged little creature. She screamed with horror in her voice, "'Susie, come here this instant. What are you doing with that ragged vagrant?' And to Janet, "'Be off with you. I'll tell the policeman to take you away. Such vagabonds as you are not allowed in the park.' Janet moved off with a full heart, wondering why she had not good clothes and pretty curls like those children, and why the nurses and everyone drove her away from them. She was too weary and bewildered to think any more. She was near the boathouse, so, sitting down on the steps, she ate her biscuit and dipped up water in her hand and drank it to quench her thirst. At the top of the bank she saw more policemen, but they were interested in more important things. So she passed on by the edge of the water until she came to a hill densely covered with trees and bushes. She turned away from the drive and climbed the hill. When she got to the top, she sat down on the ground and took off her stockings, because the twigs caught in the holes and tripped her. She took one off slowly and dropped it on the walk in a little heap, and then its mate in another little heap. She was so exhausted that she crawled under a bush whose branches bent over and touched the ground. There, completely hidden, she felt safe. No people passing, no policeman, no one to call her ragged. This seemed a forsaken and lonely spot, apparently not worth guarding, so she soon fell asleep and forgot all her woes. She slept for hours and woke with a chill, wondering where she could be. It was some time before she could remember and tell how she got there. Then memory asserted itself, and all her misery rushed back upon her. She sat up and crept out of her hiding place, feeling that she was alone in the world. No father, mother, sisters, or brothers. No Roy. No one in the wide, wide world. Not only no one to love her, but no one even to know that she existed. Alone, all alone. The throngs of people had left the park and gone to their homes, 
to eat, drink, and be merry. Little children were tucked snugly in their beds, and all the great city was at its ease. Janet was alone in the silence of the night. No sound was heard in the darkness. The night was cloudy, and she was cold, hungry, and miserable. Her brain was weak from starvation, and she said in a whisper, "'Yes, Bishop, I've kept myself clean and pure. Your stockings are here, Bishop. There's a hole in the toe, a hole in the heel, and holes all between the toe and the heel, but I've got them yet.' She put on the old shoes, and seemed to be looking for something. Her braided hair had come loose, and fell like a veil about her. Her eyes were raised to the sky. The clouds parted, and a bright star appeared. She cried out with delight. "'Oh, there you are! I've been looking for you a long time. I was afraid you had forgotten me. You need not blink at me and twinkle so. I see you. I know you. I promised to see you tonight, so I've come on this hill to be near you. You know what I want. Don't go away and leave me. It's so dark it frightens me. I'm coming to you. You are the only friend I have. I'm coming, pretty star, stay. I'm coming. Don't, oh, don't go away. Don't leave me alone, little star, for I am down here, and you are so far. Other children had been put to bed hours before, and told that angels would guard their beds through the night. The little ones thought they came down on ladders, from some place they were taught to call heaven. Janet knew nothing of warm beds, good food, or fine clothes of heaven or of angels that came down on ladders. There was a rustling of the dried leaves on the bank near the water. Janet held her breath in fear, but the sound died away. Then she continued to whisper to the star, "'You have talked to me so many nights, blinking at me through the window. I'm coming.' The child of ignorance, poverty, and despair stood on a stone to be nearer the star. The wind had risen and wrapped the girl's black hair around her like a mantle. Her arms were stretched out to the star, and her eyes were fixed with unutterable love on the shining orb. And who shall say that there were no angels waiting for her to ascend on high? Silently the child stood there, with clasped hands and wide staring eyes, until the star went out as she thought. Then she looked down into the water and saw the star there, for the clouds had parted once more, and it seemed nearer to her than it did up above. As the clouds rolled away, the silence of the night was broken by crackling twigs and loosened stones rolling down the steep side of the hill. A splash in the water, which seemed to smile as it rippled in circle after circle, until it again settled into stillness, and the star shone brilliantly as ever, but told nothing of what it had seen. Standing on the avenue after midnight was a watchful policeman. Out of the park came a mongrel dog, which ran up to him and, with a piteous whine, put his paws upon him and looked up into his face. The policeman was a kindly man, and, taking some food from his pocket, he offered it to the dog, talking to him and patting him. But the dog refused all kindness for himself. That was not what he wanted. It seemed as if tears were almost in his eyes, and he spoke as plainly as a dog could speak, looking from the policeman over to the great lonely park. The officer more than half understood him, but he was not allowed to leave his beat. The dog continued his pleading until he saw that it was of no avail. He ran back into the park and up the hill to the top, where on the walk he sniffed around the bishop's stockings that lay where Janet had dropped them. 
then with a piteous cry he sprang down the steep side of the hill and the water once more seemed to smile as it gently rippled to the bank end of janet or the christmas stockings by louise elise gibbons this recording has been by roger moline luck by mark twain this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Note. This is not a fancy sketch. I got it from a clergyman who was an instructor at Woolwich forty years ago, and who vouched for its truth. M.T. It was at a banquet in London in honor of one of the two or three conspicuously illustrious English military names of this generation. For reasons which will presently appear, I will withhold his real name and titles, and call him Lieutenant General Lord Arthur Scoresby, V.C., K.C.B., etc., etc., etc. What a fascination there is in a renowned name! There sat the man, in actual flesh, whom I had heard of so many thousands of times since that day thirty years before, when his name shot suddenly to the zenith from a Crimean battlefield, to remain forever celebrated. It was food and drink to me to look and look and look at that demigod, scanning, searching, noting, the quietness, the reserve, the noble gravity of his countenance, the simple honesty that expressed itself all over him, the sweet unconsciousness of his greatness, unconsciousness of the hundreds of admiring eyes fastened upon him, unconsciousness of the deep, loving, sincere worship welling out of the breasts of those people and flowing towards him. The clergyman at my left was an old acquaintance of mine. Clergyman now, but had spent the first half of his life in the camp and field, and as an instructor in the military school at Woolwich. Just at the moment I have been talking about, a veiled and singular light glimmered in his eyes, and he leaned down and muttered confidentially to me, indicating the hero of the banquet with a gesture. Privately, he's an absolute fool. This verdict was a great surprise to me. If its subject had been Napoleon, or Socrates, or Solomon, my astonishment could not have been greater. Two things I was well aware of, that the reverend was a man of strict veracity, and that his judgment of men was good. Therefore I knew, beyond doubt or question, that the world was mistaken about this hero. He was a fool. So I meant to find out, at a convenient moment, how the reverend, all solitary and alone, had discovered the secret. Some days later the opportunity came. And this is what the Reverend told me. About forty years ago I was an instructor in the military academy at Woolwich. I was present in one of the sections when young Scoresby underwent his preliminary examination. I was touched to the quick with pity. For the rest of the class answered up brightly and handsomely, while he—why, dear me, he didn't know anything, so to speak. He was evidently good and sweet and lovable and guileless, and so it was exceedingly painful to see him stand there, as serene as a graven image, and deliver himself of answers which were veritably miraculous for stupidity and ignorance. All the compassion in me was aroused in his behalf. I said to myself, when he comes to be examined again he will be flung over, of course, so it will be simply a harmless act of charity to ease his fall as much as I can. I took him aside, and found that he knew a little of Caesar's history, and as he didn't know anything else, I went to work and drilled him like a galley-slave on a certain line of stock questions concerning Caesar, which I knew would be used. If you'll believe me, he went through with flying colors on examination day. He went through on that purely superficial cram, and got compliments too, while others, who knew a thousand times more than he got plucked, by some strangely lucky accident, an accident not likely to happen twice in a century, he was asked no question outside of the narrow limits of his drill. It was stupefying. Well, all through his course I stood by him, with something of the sentiment which a mother feels for a crippled child, and he always saved himself, just by miracle, apparently. Now, of course, the thing that would expose him and kill him at last was mathematics. I resolved to make his death as easy as I could, so I drilled him and crammed him and crammed him and drilled him, just on the line of questions which the examiners would be most likely to use, and then launching him on his fate. Well, sir, try to conceive of the result. To my consternation he took the first prize! and with it he got a perfect ovation in the way of compliments. Sleep? There was no more sleep for me for a week. My conscience tortured me day and night. What I had done I had done purely through charity, and only to ease the poor youth's fall, 
I never had dreamed of any such preposterous result as the thing that had happened. I felt as guilty and miserable as the creator of Frankenstein. Here was a wooden head whom I had put in the way of glittering promotions and prodigious responsibilities, and but one thing could happen. He and his responsibilities would all go to ruin together at the first opportunity. The Crimean War had just broken out. Of course there had to be a war, I said to myself. We couldn't have peace and give this donkey a chance to die before he is found out. I waited for the earthquake. It came. And it made me real when it did come. He was actually gazetted to a captaincy in a marching regiment. Better men grow old and grey in the service before they climb to a sublimity like that. And who could ever have foreseen that they would go and put such a load of responsibility on such green and inadequate shoulders? I could just barely have stood it if they had made him a cornet. But a captain! Think of it! I thought my hair would turn white. Consider what I did, I who so loved repose and inaction. I said to myself, I am responsible to the country for this, and I must go along with him and protect the country against him as far as I can. So I took my poor little capital that I had saved up through years of work and grinding economy, and went with a sigh and bought a cornetcy in his regiment, and away we went to the field. And there, oh dear, it was awful. Blunders? Why, he never did anything but blunder. But you see, nobody was in the fellow's secret. Everybody had him focused wrong and necessarily misinterpreted his performance every time. Consequently, they took his idiotic blunders for inspirations of genius. They did, honestly. His mildest blunders were enough to make a man in his right mind cry, and they did make me cry, and rage and rave too, privately. And the thing that kept me always in a sweat of apprehension was the fact that every fresh blunder he made increased the luster of his reputation. I kept saying to myself he'll get so high that when discovery does finally come it will be like the sun falling out of the sky. He went right along up, from grade to grade, over the dead bodies of his superiors, until at last, in the hottest moment of the Battle of Blank, down went our colonel, and my heart jumped into my mouth, for Scoresby was next in rank. "'Now for it,' said I. "'We'll all land in Sheol in ten minutes sure.' The battle was awfully hot. The Allies were steadily giving way all over the field. Our regiment occupied a position that was vital. A blunder now must be destruction. At this crucial moment— what does this immortal fool do but detach the regiment from its place and order a charge over a neighboring hill where there wasn't a suggestion of an enemy? There you go, I said to myself. This is the end at last. And away we did go, and were over the shoulder of the hill before the insane movement could be discovered and stopped. And what did we find? An entire and unsuspected Russian army in reserve. And what happened? We were eaten up? That is necessarily what would have happened in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred. But no, those Russians argued that no single regiment would come browsing around there at such a time. It must be the entire English army and that the sly Russian game was detected and blocked. So they turned tail, and away they went pell-mell over the hill and down into the field in wild confusion, and we after them. They themselves broke the solid Russian center in the field and tore through, and in no time there was the most tremendous rout you ever saw, and the defeat of the Allies was turned into a sweeping and splendid victory. Marshal Can Robert looked on, dizzy with astonishment, admiration, and delight, and sent right off for Scoresby and hugged him, and decorated him on the field in presence of all the armies. And what was Scoresby's blunder that time? Merely the mistaking of his right hand for his left, that was all. An order had come to him to fall back and support our right, and instead he fell forward and went over the hill to the left. But the name he won that day as a marvellous military genius filled the world with his glory, and that glory will never fade while history books last." He is just as good and sweet and lovable and unpretending as a man can be, but he doesn't know enough to come in when it rains. Now that is absolutely true. He is the supremest ass in the universe, and until half an hour ago nobody knew it but himself and me. He has been pursued day by day and year by year by a most phenomenal and astonishing luckiness. He has been a shining soldier in all our wars for a generation. He has littered his whole military life with blunders, and yet has never committed one that didn't make him a knight or a baronet, or a lord, or something. Look at his breast. Why, he is just clothed in domestic and foreign decorations. Well, sir, every one of them is the record of some shouting stupidity or other, and taken together they are proof that the very best thing in all this world that can befall a man is to be born lucky. I say again, as I said at the banquet, Scoresby's an absolute fool. End of Luck by Mark Twain THE MYSTERIOUS OCCURRENCE IN PICCADILLY by Grant Allen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
recording by lynn thompson part one i really never felt so profoundly ashamed of myself in my whole life as when my father-in-law professor w bryce murray of oriel college oxford sent me the last number of the proceedings of the society for the investigation of supernatural phenomena as i opened the pamphlet a horrible foreboding seized me that i should find in it detailed at full length with my name and address in plain printing not even asterisks that extraordinary story of his about the mysterious occurrence in piccadilly i turned anxiously to page fourteen which i saw was neatly folded over at the corner and there sure enough i came upon the professor's remarkable narrative which i shall simply extract here by way of introduction in his own admirable and perspicuous language i wish to communicate to the society says my respected relation a curious case of wraiths or doubles which came under my own personal observation and for which i can vouch on my own authority and that of my son-in-law dr owen mansfield keeper of acadian antiquities at the british museum it is seldom indeed that so strange an example of a supernatural phenomenon can be independently attested by two trustworthy scientific observers both still living on the twelfth of may eighteen seventy three i made a note of the circumstance at the time and am therefore able to feel perfect confidence as to the strict accuracy of my facts i was walking down piccadilly about four o'clock in the afternoon when i saw a simulacrum or image approaching me from the opposite direction exactly resembling in outer appearance an undergraduate of oriel college of the name of owen mansfield it must be carefully borne in mind that at this time i was not related or connected with mr mansfield in any way his marriage with my daughter having taken place some eleven months earlier i only knew him then as a promising junior member of my own college i was just about to approach and address mr mansfield when a most singular and mysterious event took place the simulacrum appeared spontaneously to glide up towards me with a peculiarly rapid and noiseless motion waved a wand or staff which it bore in its hands thrice round my head and then vanished hastily in the direction of an hotel which stands at the corner of albemarle street i followed it quickly to the door but on inquiry of the porter i learned that he himself had observed nobody enter the simulacrum seems to have dissipated itself or become invisible suddenly in the very act of passing through the folding glass portals which give access to the hotel from piccadilly that same evening by the last post i received a hastily written note from mr mansfield bearing the oxford postmark dated oriel college five p m and relating the facts of an exactly similar apparition which had manifested itself to him with absolute simultaneity of occurrence on the very day and hour when i had seen mr mansfield's wraith in piccadilly mr mansfield himself was walking down the corn market in oxford in the direction of the taylor institute as he approached the corner he saw what he took to be a vision or image of myself his tutor moving towards him in my usual leisurely manner suddenly as he was on the point of addressing me with regard to an aristotle lecture the next morning the image glided up to him in a rapid and evasive manner shook a green silk umbrella with a rhinoceros horn handle three times round his head and then disappeared incomprehensibly through the door of the randolph hotel returning to college in a state of breathless alarm and surprise at what he took to be an act of incipient insanity or extreme inebriation on my part mr mansfield learnt from the porter to his intense astonishment that i was at that moment actually in london unable to conceal his amazement at this strange event he wrote me a full account of the facts while they were still fresh in his memory and as i preserve his note to this day i append a copy of it to my present communication for publication in the society's transactions 
there is one small point in the above narrative to which i would wish to call special attention and that is the accurate description given by mr mansfield of the umbrella carried by the apparition he observed in oxford this umbrella exactly coincided in every particular with the one i was then actually carrying in piccadilly but what is truly remarkable and what stamps the occurrence as a genuine case of supernatural intervention is the fact that mr mansfield could not possibly ever have seen that umbrella in my hands because i had only just that afternoon purchased it at a shop in bond street this to my mind conclusively proves that no mere effort of fancy or visual delusion based upon previous memories vague or unconscious could have had anything whatsoever to do with mr mansfield's observation at least it was in short distinctly an objective apparition as distinguished from a mere subjective reminiscence or hallucination as i laid down the proceedings on the breakfast-table with a sigh i said to my wife who had been looking over my shoulder while i read now nora we're really in for it what on earth do you suppose i'd better do nora looked at me with her laughing eyes laughing harder and brighter than ever my dear owen she said putting the proceedings promptly into the waste-paper basket there's really nothing on earth possible now except to make a clean breast of it i groaned i suppose you're right i answered but it's a precious awkward thing to have to do however here goes so i sat down at once with pen ink and paper at my desk to draw up this present narrative as to the real facts about the mysterious occurrence in piccadilly part two in 1873 i was a fourth year man going in for my greats at the june examination but as if aristotle and mill and the affair of corcyra were not enough to occupy one young fellow's head at the age of twenty-three i had foolishly gone and fallen in love undergraduate fashion with the only really pretty girl i insist upon putting it though nora has struck it out with her pen in all oxford she was the daughter of my tutor professor bryce murray and her name as the astute reader will already have inferred was nora the professor had lost his wife some years before and he was left to bring up nora by his own devices with the aid of his sister miss lydia amelia murray the well-known advocate of female education woman's rights anti-vaccination vegetarianism the tichborne claimant and psychic force nora however had no fancy for any of these multifarious interests of her aunt's i have reason to believe she takes rather after her mother's family and miss lydia amelia murray early decided that she was a girl of no intellectual tastes of any sort who had better be kept at school in south kensington as much as possible especially did aunt lydia hold it to be undesirable that nora should ever come in contact with that very objectionable and wholly antagonistic animal the oriel undergraduate undergraduates were well known to laugh openly at woman's rights to devour underdone beefsteaks with savage persistence and to utter most irreverent and ribald jests about psychic force still it is quite impossible to keep the orbit of a professor's daughter from occasionally crossing that of a stray meteoric undergraduate nora only came home to oxford in vacation time but during the preceding long i had stopped up for the sake of pursuing my acadian studies in a quiet spot and it was then that i first quite accidentally met nora i was canoeing on the churwell one afternoon when i came across the professor and his daughter in a punt and saw the prettiest girl in all oxford actually holding the pole in her own pretty little hands while that lazy old man lolled back at his ease with a book on the luxurious cushions in the stern as i passed the punt i capped the professor of course and looking back a minute later i observed that the pretty daughter had got her pole stuck fast in the mud and couldn't with all her force pull it out again in another minute she had lost her hold of it 
and the punt began to drift of itself down the river towards Ifley. Common politeness naturally made me put back my canoe, extricate the pole, and hand it as gracefully as I could to the professor's daughter. As I did so, I attempted to raise my straw hat cautiously with one hand, while I gave back the pole with the other, an attempt which, of course, compelled me to lay down my paddle on the front of the canoe, as I happened to be only provided with two hands, instead of four like our earlier ancestors. I don't know whether it was my instantaneous admiration for Nora's pretty blush, which distracted my attention from the purely practical question of equilibrium, or whether it was her own awkwardness and modesty in taking the pole, or finally whether it was my tutor's freezing look that utterly disconcerted me. But, at any rate, just at that moment something unluckily, or rather luckily, caused me to lose my balance altogether. Now everybody knows that a canoe is very easily upset, and in a moment, before I knew exactly where I was, I found the canoe floating bottom upward about three yards away from me, and myself standing, safe and dry, in my tutor's punt, beside his pretty blushing daughter. I had felt the canoe turning over as I handed back the pole, and had instinctively jumped into the safer refuge of the punt, which saved me at least the ignominy of appearing before Miss Nora Murray in the ungraceful attitude of clambering back, wet and dripping, into an upset canoe. The inexorable logic of facts had thus convinced the professor of the impossibility of keeping all undergraduates permanently at a safe distance, and there was nothing open for him now except resignedly to acquiesce in the situation so created for him. However much he might object to my presence, he could hardly, as a Christian and a gentleman, request me to jump in and swim after my canoe, or even, when we had at last successfully brought it alongside with the aid of the pole, to seat myself once more on the soaking cushions. After all, my mishap had come about in the endeavour to render him a service, so he was fain with what grace he could to let me relieve his daughter of the pole, and punt him back as far as the barges, with my own moist and uncomfortable bark trailing casually from the stern. As for Nora, being thus thrown unexpectedly into the dangerous society of that gruesome animal, the Oriel undergraduate, I think I may venture to say, from my subsequent experience, that she was not wholly disposed to regard the creature as either so objectionable or so ferocious as she had been previously led to imagine. We got on together so well that I could see the professor growing visibly wrathful about the corners of the mouth, and by the time we reached the barges, he could barely be civil enough to say good morning to me when we parted. An introduction, however, no matter how obtained, is really in these matters absolutely everything. As long as you don't know a pretty girl, you don't know her, and you can't take a step in advance without an introduction. But when once you do know her, heaven and earth and aunts and fathers may try their hardest to prevent you, and yet whatever they try, they can't keep you out. I was so far struck with Nora that I boldly ventured whenever I met her out walking with her father or her aunt to join myself to the party, and though they never hesitated to show me that my presence was not rapturously welcomed, they couldn't well say to me point blank, have the goodness, Mr. Mansfield, to go away and not to speak to me again in future. So the end of it was that before the beginning of October term, Nora and I understood one another perfectly, and had even managed in a few minutes tete-a-tete -tete in the parks to whisper to one another the ingenuous vows of sweet seventeen and two-and-twenty. When the professor discovered that I had actually written a letter to his daughter, marked private and confidential, his wrath knew no bounds. He sent for me to his rooms, and spoke to me severely. "'I've half a mind, Mansfield,' he said, "'to bring the matter before a college meeting. At any rate, this conduct must not be repeated. If it is, sir—' He didn't finish the sentence, preferring to terrify me by the effective figure of speech which commentators describe as an apotheosis. 
and i left him with a vague sense that if it was repeated i should probably incur the penalties of proemineere whatever that may be or be hanged drawn and quartered with my head finally stuck as an adornment on the acute wings of the griffin visse temple bar removed next day nora met me casually at a confectioner's in the high where i will frankly confess that i was engaged in experimenting upon the relative merits of raspberry cream and lemon water ices she gave me her hand timidly and whispered to me half under her breath papa's so dreadfully angry owen and i'm afraid i shall never be able to meet you any more for he's going to send me back this very afternoon to south kensington and keep me away from oxford altogether in future i saw her eyes were red with crying and that she really thought our little romance was entirely at an end my darling nora i replied in an undertone even south kensington is not so unutterably remote that i shall never be able to see you there write to me whenever you are able and let me know where i can write to you my dear little nora if there were a hundred papas and a thousand aunt lydias interposed in a square between us don't you know we should manage all the same to love one another and to overcome all difficulties nora smiled and half cried at once and then discreetly turned to order half a pound of glacé cherries and that was the last i saw of her for the time at oxford during the next term or two i'm afraid i must admit that the relations between my tutor and myself were distinctly strained so much so as continually to threaten the breaking out of open hostilities it wasn't merely that nora was in question but the professor also suspected me of jeering in private at his psychical investigations and if the truth must be told i will admit that his suspicions were not wholly without justification it began to be whispered among the undergraduates just then that the professor and his sister had taken to turning planchettes interrogating easy chairs and obtaining interesting details about the present abode of shakespeare or milton from intelligent and well-informed five o'clock tea-tables it had long been well known that the professor took a deep interest in haunted houses considered that the portents recorded by levy must have something in them and declared himself unable to be sceptical as to facts which had convinced such great men as plato seneca and samuel johnson but the table turning was a new fad and we noisy undergraduates occasionally amused ourselves by getting up an amateur seance in imitation of the professor and eliciting psychical truths often couched in a surprisingly slangy or even indecorous dialect from a very lively though painfully irreverent spirit who discoursed to us through the material intervention of a rickety what-not however as the only mediums we employed were the very unprofessional ones of two plain decanters respectively containing port and sherry the professor who was a teetotaler and who paid five guineas a seance for the services of that distinguished psychical specialist dr grade considered the interesting results we obtained as wholly beneath the dignity of scientific inquiry he even most unworthily endeavoured to stifle research by gating us all one evening when a materialised spirit assuming the outer form of the junior exhibitioner sang a comic song of the period in a loud voice with the windows open and accompanied itself noisily with a psychical tattoo on the rickety what-not the professor went so far as to observe sarcastically that our results appeared to him to be rather spiritous than spiritual on may the eleventh eighteen seventy three i will endeavour to rival the professor in accuracy and preciseness i got a short note from dear nora dated from south kensington which i too though not from psychical motives have carefully preserved i will not publish it however either here or in the society's proceedings for reasons which will probably be obvious to any of my readers who happen ever to have been placed in similar circumstances themselves disengaging the kernel of fact from the irrelevant matter in which it was embedded i may state that nora wrote me somewhat to this effect she was going next day to the academy with the parents of some schoolfellow 
could i manage to run up to town for the day go to the academy myself and meet her quite accidentally you know dear in the water-colour room about half-past eleven this was rather awkward for next day as it happened was precisely the professor's morning for the herodotus lecture but circumstances like mine at that moment know no law so i succeeded in excusing myself from attendance somehow or other i hope truthfully and took the nine a m express up to town shortly after eleven i was at the academy and waiting anxiously for nora's arrival that dear little hypocrite the moment she saw me approach assumed such an inimitable air of infantile surprise and innocent pleasure at my unexpected appearance that i positively blushed for her wicked powers of deception you here mr mansfield she cried in a tone of the most apparently unaffected astonishment why i thought it was full term time surely you ought to be up at Oriel. so i am i answered officially but in my private capacity i've come up for the day to look at the pictures oh how nice said that shocking little nora with a smile that was childlike and bland mr mansfield is such a great critic mrs walpolston he knows all about art and artists and so on he'll be able to tell us which pictures we ought to admire you know and which aren't worth looking at mr walpolston let me introduce you mrs walpolston miss walpolston how very lucky we should have happened to come across you mr mansfield the Walpolstons fell immediately like lambs into the trap so ingenuously spread for them indeed i have always noticed that ninety-nine per cent of the british public when turned into an art gallery are only too glad to accept the opinion of anybody whatsoever who is bold enough to have one and to express it openly having thus been thrust by nora into the arduous position of critic by appointment to the Walpolston party i deliver myself ex cathedra forthwith upon the merits and demerits of the entire exhibition and i was so successful in my critical views that i not only produced an immense impression upon mr Walpolston himself but also observed many ladies in the neighbourhood nudge one another as they gazed intently backward and forward between wall and catalogue and heard them whisper audibly among themselves a gentleman here says the flesh tones on that shoulder are simply marvellous or that artist in the tweed suit behind us thinks the careless painting of the ferns in the foreground quite unworthy of such a colourist as daubiton so highly was my criticism appreciated in fact that mr walpolston even invited me to lunch with nora and his party at a neighbouring restaurant where i spent the most delightful hour i had passed for the last half year in the company of that naughty mendacious little schemer about four o'clock however the walpustons departed taking nora with them to south kensington and i prepared to walk back in the direction of paddington meaning to catch an evening train and return to oxford i was strolling in a leisurely fashion along piccadilly towards the park and looking into all the photographer's windows and suddenly an awful apparition loomed upon me the professor himself coming round the corner from bond street folding up a new rhinoceros handled umbrella as he walked along in a moment i felt that all was lost i was up in town without leave the professor would certainly see me and recognize me he would ask me how and why i had left the university contrary to rules and i must then either tell him the whole truth which would get nora into a fearful scrape or else run the risk of being sent down in disgrace which might prevent me from taking a degree and would at least cause my father and mother an immense deal of unmerited trouble like a flash of lightning a wild idea shot instantaneously across my brain might i pretend to be my own double the professor was profoundly superstitious on the subject of wraiths apparitions ghosts brain waves and supernatural appearances generally if i could only manage to impose upon him for a moment by doing something outrageously uncommon or eccentric i might succeed in stifling further inquiry by setting him from the beginning on a false track which he was naturally prone to follow before i had time to reflect upon the consequences of my act 
the wild idea had taken possession of me body and soul and had worked itself out in action with all the rapidity of a mad impulse i rushed frantically up to the professor with my eyes fixed in a vacant stare on a point in space somewhere above the tops of the chimney pots i waved my stick three times mysteriously around his head and then without giving him time to recover from his surprise or to address a single word to me i bolted off in a red indian dance to the nearest corner there was a hotel there which i had often noticed before though i had never entered it and i rushed wildly in meaning to get out as best i could when the professor who is very short-sighted had passed on along piccadilly in search of me but fortune as usual favoured the bold luckily it was a corner house and to my surprise i found when i got inside it that the hall opened both ways with a door on to the side street the porter was looking away as i entered so i merely ran in of one door and out of the other never stopping till i met a hansom into which i jumped and ordered the man to drive to paddington i just caught the four thirty five to oxford and by a little over six o'clock i was in my own rooms at oriel it was very wrong of me indeed i acknowledge it now but the whole thing had flashed across my undergraduate mind so rapidly that i carried it out in a moment before i could at all realize what a very foolish act i was really committing to take a rise out of the professor and to save nora an angry interview were the only ideas that occurred to me at the second when i began to reflect upon it afterwards i was conscious that i had really practised a very gross and wicked deception however there was no help for it now and as i rolled along in the train to oxford i felt that to save myself and nora from utter disgrace i must carry the plot out to the end without flinching it then occurred to me that a double apparition would be more in accordance with all recognised principles of psychical manifestation than a single one at reading therefore i regret to say i bought a pencil and a sheet of paper and an envelope and before i reached oxford station i had written to the professor what i now blush to acknowledge as a tissue of shocking fables in which i paralleled every particular of my own behaviour to him by a similar imaginary piece of behaviour on his part to me only changing the scene to oxford it was awfully wrong i admit at the time however being yet but little more than a schoolboy after all i regarded it simply in the light of a capital practical joke i informed the professor gravely how i had seen him at four o'clock in the corn market and how astonished i was when i found him waving his green silk umbrella three times wildly around my head the moment i arrived at oxford i dashed up to college in a hansom and got the professor's address in london from the porter he had gone up to town for the night it seemed probably to visit nora and would not be back in college till the next morning then i rushed down to the post office where i was just in time with an extra stamp to catch the last post for that night's delivery the moment the letter was in the box i repented and began to fear i had gone too far and when i got back to my own rooms at last and went down late for dinner in hall i confess i trembled not a little as to the possible effect of my quite too bold and palpable imposition next morning by the second post i got a long letter from the professor which completely relieved me from all immediate anxiety as to his interpretation of my conduct he rose to the fly with a charming simplicity which showed how delighted he was at this personal confirmation of all his own most cherished superstitions my dear mansfield his letter began now hear what at the very self-same hour and minute happened to me in piccadilly in fact he had swallowed the whole thing entire without a single moment's scepticism or hesitation from what i heard afterwards it was indeed a lucky thing for me that i had played him this shocking trick for nora believes he was then actually on his way to south kensington on purpose to forbid her most stringently from holding any further communication with me in any way but as soon as this mysterious event took place he began to change his mind about me altogether 
so remarkable an apparition could not have happened except for some good and weighty reason he argued and he suspected that the reason might have something to do with my intentions towards nora why when he was on his way to warn her against me should a vision bearing my outer and bodily shape come straight across his path and by vehement signs of displeasure endeavour to turn him from his purpose unless it were clearly well for nora that my attentions should not be discouraged from that day forth the professor began to ask me to his rooms and address me far more cordially than he had used to do before he even on the strength of my singular adventure invited me to assist at one or two of his psychical seances here i must confess i was not entirely successful the distinguished medium complained that i exerted a repellent effect upon the spirits who seemed to be hurt by my want of generous confidence in their good intentions and by my suspicious habit of keeping my eyes too sharply fixed upon the legs of the tables he declared that when i was present an adverse influence seemed to pervade the room due apparently to my painful lack of spiritual sympathies but the professor condoned my failure in the regular psychical line in consideration of my brilliant success as a beholder of wraiths and visions after i took my degree that summer he used all his influence to procure me the post of keeper of the acadian antiquities at the museum for which my previous studies had excellently fitted me and by his friendly aid i was enabled to obtain the post though i regret to say that in spite of his credulity in supernatural matters he still refuses to believe in the correctness of my conjectural interpretation of the celebrated amalekite cylinders imported by mr ananias which i have deciphered in so very simple and satisfactory a manner as everybody knows my translation may be regarded as perfectly certain if only one makes the very modest assumption that the cylinders were originally engraved upside down by an aztec captive who had learned broken acadian with a bad accent from a chinese exile and who occasionally employed egyptian hieroglyphics in correct senses to piece out his own very imperfect idiom and doubtful spelling of the early babylonian language the solitary real doubt in the matter is whether certain extraordinary marks in the upper left-hand corner of the cylinder are to be interpreted as accidental scratches or as a picture representing the triumph of a king over seven bound prisoners or finally as an acadian sentence in cuneiforms which may be translated either as to the memory of on the great or else as pithor the high priest dedicates a fat goose to the family dinner on the twenty-fifth of the month of midwinter every candid and unprejudiced mind must admit that these small discrepancies or alternatives in the opinions of experts can cast no doubt at all upon the general soundness of the method employed but persons like the professor while ready to accept any evidence at all where their own prepossessions are concerned can never be induced to believe such plain and unvarnished statements of simple scientific knowledge however the end of it all was that before i had been a month at the museum i had obtained the professor's consent to my marriage with nora and as i had had nora's own consent long before we were duly joined together in holy matrimony early in october at oxford and came at once to live in hampstead so as it turned out i finally owed the sweetest and best little wife in all christendom to the mysterious occurrence in piccadilly End of the mysterious occurrence in piccadilly by grant allen the quest of mr t b by sarah orne jewett this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Perard. the quest of mr t b by sarah orne jewett the trees were bare on meadow and hill and all about the country one saw the warm brown of lately fallen leaves 
there was still a cheerful bravery of green in sheltered places a fine live green that flattered the eye with its look of permanence the first three quarters of the year seemed to have worked out their slow processes to make this perfect late autumn day in such weather i found even the east wilby railroad station attractive and waiting three hours for a slow train became a pleasure the delight of idleness and even booklessness cannot be properly described the interior of the station was bleak and gravelly but it would have been possible to find fault with any interior on such an out-of-doors day and after the station-master had locked his ticket office door and tried the handle twice with a comprehensive look at me he went slowly away up the road to spend some leisure time with his family he had ceased to take any interest in the travelling public and answered my questions as briefly as possible after he had gone some distance he turned to look back but finding that i still sat on the baggage truck in the sunshine just where he left me he smothered his natural apprehensions and went on one might spend a good half hour in watching crows as they go southward resolutely through the clear sky and then waver and come straggling back as if they had forgotten something one might think over all one's immediate affairs and learn to know the outward aspect of such a place as east will be as if born and brought up there after a while i lost interest in both past and future there was too much landscape before me at the moment and a lack of figures the weather was not to be enjoyed merely as an end yet there was no temptation to explore the uphill road on the left or the level fields on the right i sat still in my baggage truck and waited for something to happen sometimes one is so happy that there is nothing left to wish for but to be happier and just as the remembrance of this truth illuminated my mind i saw two persons approaching from opposite directions the first to arrive was a pleasant-looking elderly countrywoman well wrapped in a worn winter cloak with a thick plaid shawl over it and a white worsted cloud tied over her bonnet she carried a well-preserved bandbox the outlines were perfect under its checked gingham cover and had a large bundle beside securely rolled in a newspaper from her dress i felt sure that she had made a mistake in dates and expected winter to set in at once her face was crimson with undue warmth and what appeared in the end to have been unnecessary haste she did not take any notice of the elderly man who reached the platform a minute later until they were near enough to take each other by the hand and exchange most cordial greetings well this is a treat said the man who was a small and shivery looking person he carried a great umbrella and a thin enameled cloth valise and wore an ancient little silk hat and a nearly new greenish linen duster as if it were yet summer i was full of thinking o you day before yesterday strange wasn't it he announced impressively in a plaintive voice i was saying to myself if there was one livin being i coveted to encounter over east wilby way twas you sister pinkham warm to-day ain't it responded sister pinkham how's your health mr teeby i guess i'd better set right down here on the page of the platform shan't we get more air than if we went inside the depot it's necessary to get my breath before i rise the hill you can't seem to account for them foresights continued mr teeby putting down his tall thin valise and letting the empty top of it fold over then he stood his umbrella against the end of my baggage truck without a glance at me i was glad that they were not finding me in their way well if this ain't very singular i never saw nothing that was repeated the little man nothing can set forth to explain why the thought of you should have been so borne in upon me day before yesterday your livin countenance and all and here we be to-day set inside o one another i've come to rely on them foresights 
they've been of considerable use in my business too trade good is common this fall inquired sister pinkham languidly you don't carry such a thing as a good palm leaf fan amongst your stuff i expect it does appear to me as if i hadn't been more head up any day this year i should have had the observation to offer it before said mr teaby with pride yes sister pinkham i've got an excellent fan right here and you shall have it he reached for his bag i heard a clink as if there were bottles within presently his companion began to fan herself with that steady sway and lop of the palm leaf which one sees only in country churches in midsummer weather mr teaby edged away a little as if he feared such a steady trade wind we might have picked out a shadier spot on your account he suggested can't you unpin your shawl not while i'm so hit answered sister pinkham coldly is there anything new recommended for rheumatic complaints you're getting up new compounds right straight along and stand sights of printed bills urgent of me to buy em i don't beseech none of my customers to take them strange nostrums that i ain't able to recommend some is new cotches made of good old standbys i expect said sister pinkham and there was a comfortable silence of some minutes i'm kind of surprised to meet you to-day when all's said and done it's kind of started me when i see twas you after dwelling on you so day before yesterday insisted mr teaby and this time sister pinkham took heed of the interesting coincidence thinking of me was you and she stopped the fan a moment and turned to look at him with interest i was so well i never see nobody that kept her looks as you do and being a sufferer too as one may express it sister pinkham sighed heavily and began to ply the fan again you was saying just now that you found them foresight notions work into your business yes am i saved a valuable life this spring i was putting up my vials to start out over briggsville way and was impressed upon me that i'd better carry a portion o up a dildack i was loaded up heavy had all i could lug of spring goods salt and sen and them big bottle spring bitters o mine that folks counts on regular i could get the opodildac out o my mind no way and i didn't want it for nothing nor nobody but i had to remove a needed vial of some kind of essence to give it place when i was going down the lane towards abel dean's house his women folks come flying out child's a dying in here says they tumble down the cellar stairs they was like crazy creatures i give em the vial right there in the lane and they run in and i followed em last time i was there the child was a playin out looked rugged and hearty they've never forgot it and never will said mr teaby impressively with a pensive look toward the horizon want me to stop over night with em any time or come and take the hoss or anything miss dean she buys four times the essences and stuff she wants kind of gratified you see and didn't want to lose the child i expect though she's got a number of others if it hadn't been for it being so impressed on my mind i should have omitted that opodildac i deem it a winter remedy chiefly perhaps the young one would have come too without none they do survive right through everything and then again they seem to be taken away right in their tracks sister pinkham grew more talkative as she cooled heard any news as you come along some vaguely responded mr teaby folks generally relates anything that's occurred since they seen me before i ain't no great hand for news and never was pity about you uncle teaby there anybody don't like to have deaths occur and them things and be unawares of em and the last to know when folks calls in sister pinkham laughed at first but said her say with spirit 
certain we all of us ought to show an interest i did hear it reported that elder fry calculates to give up preaching and go into the creamery business another spring you know he's had means left him and his throat's kind of give out trouble with the pipes i called it brown caters and explained nigh as i could without hurting of his pride that he bawled more than any pipes could stand i get so wore out settin under him that i feel to go and lay right out in the woods arterwards where it's still twon't never do for him to deal so with calling of his cows they'd be so aggravated twould be more than any butter business could bear you hadn't ought to speak so light now he's a very feeling man towards any one in trouble sister pinkham rebuked the speaker i said considerable by elder fry you sort of divert yourself dallying round the country with your essences and remedies and you ain't never sagged down with no settled grievance as most do think of what the elders been through a losin old three good wives i'm one of them that ain't found life come none too easy and elder fry's preaching stayed my mind considerable i suppose you're right if you think you be acknowledged the little man humbly i can't say as i esteem myself so fortunate as most i'm a lonesome creetur and always was you know i be i did expect somebody engage my affections before this they are plenty be glad to have you i expect they would but i don't seem to be drawed to none on em replied mr teeby with a mournful shake of his head i've spoke pretty decided to quite a number in my time take em all together but it always appeared best not to follow it up and so when i'd come their way again i'd laugh it off or something in case twas referred to i seen one now and then that i kind of fancy but tain't the real thing you mustn't expect to pick out a handsome gal at your age insisted sister pinkham in a business-like way time's past for all that and you've got the name of a rover i've heard some say that you was rich but that ain't everything you must take who you can get and look you up a good home i would if you was to be taken down with any settled complaint you'd be distressed to be without a place of your own and i'm glad to have this chance to tell you so plenty of folks is glad to take you in for a short spell and you've had an excellent chance to look the ground over well i tell you you're beginning to get along in years i know i be said mr teeby i can't travel now as i used to i have to favor my left leg i do know but i'll be spoilt for settling down this business i never meant to follow steady in the fust place it twas a means to an end as one may say folks would miss ye but you could take a good long trip say spring and fall and live quiet the rest of the year what if they do get out a essence a lemon and peppermint this sufficient to the stores take as it used to be when you begun there's anna maria hart my oldest sister's daughter i kind of call it home with her by spells and when the travelling's bad good king agrippy if that's the best you can do i feel for you exclaimed the energetic adviser she's a harmless creetur and seems to keep plodding but slack ain't no description and runs on talking about nothing till it strikes right in and numbs it she's pressed for house room too hart ought to put on an addition long ago but he's too stingy to live folks was telling me that somebody observed to him how he'd got a real good steady man to work with him this summer he's called a very pious man too great hand in meetings mr hart says they and says he i'd have you recollect he's a praying out of my time said it hasty too as if he meant it well i can put up with hart he's near but he uses me well and i try to do the same by him i don't bange on him i pay my way and i feel as if everything was temporary i did plan to go way over north dexter way where i've never been and see if there wa not somebody 
but the weather ain't been settled as i could wish and i'm always expectin to find her i'd be so at which i'd observed sister pinkham's frame shake i felt a slight reproach of conscience at listening so intently to these entirely private affairs and at this point reluctantly left my place and walked along the platform to remind sister pinkham and confiding mr teeby of my neighbourhood they gave no sign that there was any objection to the presence of a stranger and so i came back gladly to the baggage truck and we all kept silence for a little while a fine flavour of extracts was wafted from the valise to where i sat i pictured to myself the solitary and hopeful wanderings of mr teeby there was an air about him of some distinction he might have been a decayed member of the medical profession i observed that his hands were unhardened by any sort of rural work and he sat there a meek and appealing figure with his antique hat and linen duster beside the well wadded round shoulders of friendly sister pinkham the expression of their backs was most interesting you might express it that i've got quite a number of good homes i've got me sorted out a few regular places where i mostly stop mr teeby explained presently i like to visit with the old folks and speak of the past together and the boys and gals they always have some kind of fun going on when i get along they always have to get me out to the barn and tell me if they're a courtin and i fetch and carry for em in that case and help out all i can i've made peace when they got into some of their misunderstanding and then times they set a good deal by uncle teeby but they ain't all got along as well as they expected and that's been one thing that's made me desirous not to get fooled myself but i do know as folks would be reconciled to my settling down in one place i've gathered a good many extra receipts for things and folks all calls me something of a doctor you know my grandfather was one on my mother's side well you've had my counsel for what it's worth said the woman not unkindly trouble is you want better bread than's made a wheat i'm most ashamed to ask ye again if twouldn't be any use to lay the matter before hannah jane pingham this was spoken lower but i could hear the gentle suggestion i'm obliged to you said the lady of mr teeby's choice but i ain't the right one don't you go to settin your mind on me tain't worth while i'm older than you be and apt to break down with my rheumatic complaints you don't want nobody on your hands i'd get a younger woman i would so i've been a-lookin for the right one a sight of years hannah jane i've had a kind of notion i should know her right off when i fust see her but i'm afeard it ain't goin to be that way i've seen a sight o nice smart women but when the thought o you was so impressed on my mind day before yesterday i'm sorry to disoblige you but if i have anybody i'm kind of half promised to elder fry announced sister pinkham bravely i consider it more on the off side than i did at first if he'd continue preaching i'd favor it more but i dread having to tend to a growing butter business and to sense them new machines taint as if he'd established it i've just begun to have things easy but there i feel as if i had a lot of work left in me and i don't know tis right to let it go to waste i expect the elder would preach some by spells and we could ride about and see folks and he'd always be called to funerals and have some variety one way and another i urge him not to quit preaching i'd rather he undertook most anything else said mr teeby rising and trying to find the buttons of his linen duster i could see a bitter shade of jealousy cloud his amiable face but sister pinkham looked up at him and laughed sit down sit down she said we ain't in no hurry and uncle teeby relented and lingered i'm all out of rose water for the eyes she told him and if you got a vial of lemon left that you'll part with reasonable 
i do know but i'll take that i'd rather have caught you when you was outward bound your bag looks kind of slim everything's fresh made just before i started except the ginger and that i buy but it's called the best there is the two sat down and drove a succession of sharp bargains but finally parted the best of friends mr t b kindly recognized my presence from a business point of view and offered me a choice of his wares at reasonable prices i asked about a delightful jumping-jack which made its appearance and wished very much to become the owner for it was curiously whittled out and fitted together by mr t b s own hands he exhibited the toy to sister pinkham and me to our great pleasure but scorned to sell such a trifle it being worth nothing and beside he had made it for a little girl who lived two miles farther along the road he was following i could see that she was a favorite of the old man's and said no more about the matter but provided myself as recommended with an ample package of court plaster in case of accident before i got to where i was going and a small bottle of smelling salts described as reviving to the faculties then we watched mr t b plod away a quaint figure with his large valise nearly touching the ground as it hung slack from his right hand the greenish-brown duster looked bleak and unseasonable as a cloud went over the sun it appeared to symbolize the youthful and spring-like hopes of the wearer decking the autumn days of life poor creature said sister pinkham there he does need somebody to look after him she turned to me frankly and i asked how far he was going oh he'll put up at that little gal's house and get his dinner and give her the jumping jack and trade a little and then he'll work along the road calling from place to place he's got a good deal of system and was a smart boy so that folks expected he was going to make a doctor but he kind of petered out he's long-winded and harping and some folks praise him by if they can but there most likes him and there's nobody would be more missed he don't make no trouble for em he'll take right hold and help and there ain't nobody more gentle with the sick always has some of his nonsense over to me this was added with sudden consciousness that i must have heard the recent conversation but we only smiled at each other and good sister pinkham did not seem displeased we both turned to look again at the small figure of mr t b as he went away with his queer tripping gait along the level road pretty day if it won't quite so warm said sister pinkham as she rose and reached for her bandbox and bundle to resume her own journey there if here ain't uncle t b s umbrella he forgets everything that belongs to him but that old valise folks wouldn't know him if he left that you may as well just hand it to asa briggs the depot master when he gets back likes not the old gentleman old think to call for it as he comes back along here's his fan too but he won't likely to want that this winter she looked at the large umbrella there was a great deal of good material in it but it was considerably out of repair i don't know but i'll stop and mend it up for him poor old creature she said slowly with an apologetic look at me then she sat down again pulled a large rolled-up needle-book from her deep and accessible pocket and sewed busily for some time with strong stitches i sat by and watched her and was glad to be of use in chasing her large spool of linen thread which repeatedly rolled away along the platform sister pinkham's affectionate thoughts were evidently following her old friend i have a great mind to walk back with the umbrella he may need it and taint a great ways she said to me and then looked up quickly blushing like a girl i wish she would for my part but it did not seem best for a stranger to give advice in such serious business i'll tell you what i will do she told me innocently a moment afterwards i'll take the umbrella along with me and leave word with asa briggs i've got it i go right by his house so you needn't charge your mind nothing about it by the time she had taken off her gold bowed spectacles 
and put them carefully away and was ready to make another start she had learned where i came from and where i was going and what my name was all this being but poor return for what i had gleaned of the history of herself and mr t i watched sister pinkham until she disappeared umbrella in hand over the crest of a hill far along the road to the eastward End of The Quest of Mr. Teeby by Sarah Orne Jewett